Hello and welcome back. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Today we are going to be doing a dev diary rundown of Tinto Talk number six, which is for Project Caesar, is the code name, and everyone pretty much thinks it's EU5 at this point, and there's not much reason to not say it's EU5, except if you really care way too much about qualifying your statements like I do. Um, so, uh, this is what we're going to be getting into. It's going to be a bit short. We don't have too much news today. It's just kind of just this little bit here, but it's introducing a feature that I think is actually quite strong and quite important uh, for, uh, you know, the general general progression that you get in a European Universalis game, which is that, you know, blobbing initially should be quite hard because building an empire out from a base of power should be difficult and you should have problems. And this introduces a mechanic that gives you problems, I assume more uh, exacerbated at the beginning, and then it gets easier and easier as you build up into the later game and you will get the kind of feel that you have in EU4 with, uh, I forget the mechanic in EU4, but you generally start expanding a lot faster um, in war goal cost is one of the things, but let's get into it. Welcome to the sixth Tinto Talks, where we'll talk about the design features of our not yet announced game. Not yet announced, definitely not EU5, honk honk, uh, with the code name Project Caesar. Uh, hey, before jumping into topics today, I just wanted to wish you a happy Wednesday. Wait. He misspelled all of that. Oh, I would like to show something very fresh out of the oven, based on your feedback last week. So this is interesting as well. Apparently they've updated something. This is why we're doing these Tinto Talks, to make Project Caesar your game as much as ours. Um, and here we have, is this the Domini? Uh, is kind of the new one uh, coming in here, and the Emir here, uh, and the Ulama, and the Burgers. And so maybe we're having bifurcated religion. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, actually, that's substantively different, but there are a bunch of different uh, religious ones in the Ulama and also... Or, what exactly is the Demi again? These are the persecuted religious guys. I forget, um, but he's not explaining it, so we're going to continue on. Today we will delve, delve into three concepts that are rather new to our games, but first we'll talk about locations a bit more. Not every location on the map is the same, especially, this is, has to be true, especially not in a game such as, uh, of the scope as Project Caesar. By default, every ownable location is a rural settlement, but there will be two upgrades to it that can be done. So this is... Uh, very interesting and moddable, and it's also going to be similar to Imperator system. First, you can form a town in a location, which allows you to increase the population capacity of the location and allows for a completely different set of buildings than the rural settlement. Does this seem familiar? Because it's an Imperator. Uh, finally, uh, finally, finally is a weird one to use when you only have a list of two. You should do secondarily, but whatever. Finally, you can grant city rights to a town, which allows for even further advantages. Now, you may be wonder, why don't I turn every location into a city? Besides the cost and the population requirement, there's also the drawback of them uh, tend to pr reduce your food production while also adding more nobles, clergy, and a lot of burgers to your country. Uh, and so that is going to be an interesting one. It seems very similar to Imperator's system, and so um, you know, you're going to want to I guess decide where it is you want your cities, uh, feed them with the more rural areas, and maybe, maybe you can even like use the rest of your empire slash other countries to support the food, uh, like you can do an Imperator to some extent, so that you can build taller and taller and taller. And this mechanic allows you to, uh, you know, kind of there to be some granularity in your decision making in regards to how tall you can build based on you know food acquisition or these types of things. Stockholm, Dublin, and Belgrade are uh, examples of towns that uh, towns at the start of the game, while cities include places like Beijing, Alexandria, and Paris. And here you can see the control that Sweden currently has. So control is going to be the concept they are introducing, and it radiates outward from your capital, and it is tied to your capital very, very importantly. Um, every location you own has a control value. And if you like, if you study history a little bit, um, you know, uh, at least before, let's say, maybe the industrial era, um, or even actually post-industrial era, uh, what was the the downfall of a lot of empires was the fact that they become so stretched out that the sending of information and the keeping the far-flung empire together, both in terms of armies, infor uh, information, administration, all became incredibly difficult. And one of the reasons Rome was able to expand so far was because they built so many roads, uh, and this allowed them to effectively make, uh, in terms of the travel time of information, 
nation, administration, and armies, it effectively reduced it, which allowed it to have a greater reach from the capital or the central authority. But continuing on to control, every location that you own has control value, which is primarily determined by the proximity it has to the capital or another source of authority in your country. And so maybe you can make like courthouses or like uh, administrative centers and this type of thing. There are only a few things that increase it above the proximity impact, but uh, many other things can decrease it further. And so um, these other sources of authority, I'm guessing as the game goes on, will allow you to, you'll get more and more options for these, and these will allow you to build a bigger and bigger empire, but blobbing in the initial, uh, you know, few, couple hundred years might be difficult. This is probably the most important value you have, as it determines how much value you can get out of each location, as it directly impacts how much you can tax the population in that location, and the amount of levies uh, that will they will contribute when called. I wonder, so in Victoria 3, if you tax a pop, you take the money away from them, and they don't get to spend it on consumption. I wonder if there will be a similar system where not taxing pops will help them be more wealthy, but I kind of doubt this will be the case, but we'll see. A lack of control reduces the crown power you gain from population, while also reduces the potential manpower and sailors you can get and weakens the market attraction of your own markets, making them likelier uh, to belong to foreign markets if they have low control. Okay, so we have this control mechanic. Um, and here we have effective control. The control of Kalmar is currently 56% and it changes by plus 0.2 each month. And then we can see several modifiers uh, while having the certain, or we can see what the effects it's giving. It's giving negative crown power, negative sailors, ne negative monthly manpower, uh, but is increasing levy size and, uh, or it is not decreasing levy size. I assume they said levies would be bigger if you have it, right? Uh, if you have more control. And market project uh, protection is plus 28%. I assume it would be higher if you had more. Okay, so. Access to 56% of the t potential tax base. And then we have proximity, which is similar. So what is proximity? It's basically the distance to a capital value. So everything's going to be around your capital. I hope you can move your capital. Uh, where traveling on the open sea is extremely costly. And notice they said open sea. So I'm guessing, and we can kind of tell from the Sweden, uh, the inland sea is not as much of a problem. Or like the, uh, the, the yeah, the... I forget, is this called an inland sea? I'm not 100% sure, uh, but this region is not the open sea, as it were, and so uh, it's not as much a problem, but that will make colonial administration or like controlling places way overseas much more difficult. Um, we're traveling on the open seas, it's costly. Proximity is uh, costly over land, but uh, along coastlines where you have a high maritime presence, you can keep proximity much further. So expanding in a coastal way will be much, much easier, um, which really probably gives a lot of power to countries like Spain and Portugal and this type of thing, because they will be able to maintain a firm grip um, rather than something like Russia, where, uh, you know, uh, you would have to expand by land deeper and deeper into Russia. And this makes a whole bunch of sense because you can uh, you convey information, armies, administration, etc., much quickly over uh, by water if you know you're traveling a decent chunk of different distance. Tracing proximity along a major river reduces proximity cost a fair bit, which is nice. And if you build a road network like Rome, they all lead to Rome. They should have led to Carthage. Uh, that will further reduce the proximity costs. There are buildings you can build, like a bailiff, that will act as a smaller proximity source, uh, but that has the slight drawback of adding much more nobles to a region uh, in a location which and with a food cost for them. Okay. And then we have maritime presence. Every coastal location around your locations or where you have special buildings, you have a maritime presence. This is slowly built up over time based on your ports and other buildings you have in the adjacent locations. Placing a navy in the location will help it improve quicker. And this sounds, I'm very excited about like this type of feature where, you know, the navy will be like a sort of structural backbone to your ability to establish maritime presence. And I think this is going to affect uh, proximity in a positive way. And so your ability to keep your empire together is contingent on your navy in a way that seems uh, interactive and interesting, at least based on very limited information we have here. Um, but blockades and pirates will decrease it quickly, making it absolutely vital to protect your coastlines in a war, or you'll suffer the consequences for a long time. 
As mentioned earlier, the maritime presence uh, impacts the proximity calculations. And so more maritime presence, uh, the better the proximity, but also, but it also impacts the power of your merchants uh, in the market of the sea zone, of the, in the market the sea zone is a part of. So this is pretty nice as well. We can see some market stuff. We can see the Riga market, uh, and then we can see, I don't know if this is maritime presence of both the Hanseatic League and the Kingdom of Sweden. Um, I don't know how to, we want to interpret all this information, but it is going to be a substantive thing. So we got a little bit of news uh, regarding, you know, the Navy and also this notion of control and proximity and how you're going to have to try and maintain, uh, you know, control from your capital and doing this through the seas, uh, but not through the open seas is going to be a major uh, factor in how you go about things. And stay tuned. Next week, we'll be doing an overview of the economy system, which is very exciting, which will look which has quite a few, uh, quite a lot of new features, uh, as well as features from older games. This will be really exciting because I'm wondering if they're going to use the trade goods system or something like this, or to what extent they might use this. Um, and so we will be hearing about that next week. But for this week, this was our happy Thursday, or happy Wednesday, sorry. Uh, this was our happy Wednesday, Tinto Talk number six, the introduction of the notion of control, proximity, and maritime presence here, which is all very exciting. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, please feel free to like, comment, subscribe, do the YouTube algorithm thing, and other than that, other than that, have a happy Wednesday.